have your Bibles. Um, am I on here? One, two, test. Yeah, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? I'm going to take your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of John chapter number 17. So excited about where the Lord is leading us in the next coming weeks and months as we continue our series um, on the names of God. And as I shared with you last week, what God is really doing to us through these names is He's revealing to us His character and His attributes. And as we start and continue to delve into these names, uh, my hope and my prayer is that Jesus' prayer for His disciples uh, would be answered. And this is what I want to share with you this morning as we um, look at the next name in our series. Um, in John chapter number 17, Jesus does something really incredible, really profound in this passage. Um, I think most of you are familiar with the setting, with the backstory, the situation, the context. Um, he's spending the last few hours with his disciples. He's done so much and all you have to do is go back to chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16 to really get the gist of all that is going on. Everything from washing their feet and revealing to them and, and imparting to them the importance of, of being a servant. He reveals to them the power and the significance of the Holy Spirit of God in chapter 14. In chapter 15, he brings to light the fact that, that he is the vine and we are the branches. In chapter 16, the promise of the Holy Spirit is is made clear, and after revealing all these different things to his disciples, <clears throat> he stops all that he's doing, and now he falls on his knees, and he begins to pray to the Father on behalf of his followers, and this is where the story picks up. Look with me in chapter 17. I'm going to read three verses. It says this, and these words spake Jesus, speaking of all the words that we just discussed, that we just looked at from chapters 13 to 16. These words spake Jesus, and he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, and thy Son also may glorify thee. Right there in that one verse, God reveals to us our purpose, why we exist. We simply exist, and he's left us on this planet for one reason, and one reason only, and that is to glorify him. The methods and the things that we impart to you and how we do that is really key but glorifying God simply means becoming more like him and the only way to become more like him is simply to continue to grow in knowing him it says this in verse 2 as thou has given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as thou has given him and this is life eternal that they, speaking of the disciples, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Those are the words of Jesus to the Father on our behalf. His prayer for us and his prayer for his followers is simply this, that we would simply get to know him. This is what our series has been about. And as we concluded our study in Ephesians last, last winter, right around December, we spent so much time in this letter to the Ephesians. The Ephesians, the word Ephesian being fully purposed or the fully purposed church. My hope and our prayer, my prayer for this body is that we would realize our purpose. That we would embrace the, the vision that he's established for us, especially in 2017 and we're going to talk briefly here in a minute, but it's, we're coming up on two years this spring that God blessed us with this facility. And we spent a lot of time the last year and a half focusing on the building and getting it all cleaned up and nice because it used to be a preschool before we moved in. And believe me, it looked like a preschool. But by God's grace and a lot of your faithfulness and your commitment and your giving of, of resources, of money and time, God has blessed us with an incredibly useful facility. What is the word facility about? To facilitate. To facilitate what? Going out those doors and like that sign over the door says, entering the mission field. And that's going to be our focus in 17 is really focusing 
on the mission field that God has established for us. So as soon as we're done with this little mini-series that we've titled The Names of God, we're going to delve into one of the most amazing books in all the Bible. It's known as the book of Acts. My hope and my prayer is that we would understand the power and the depth and the commitment of the early church and how God did some incredible things to see the world come to Christ. So before we do delve into the book of Acts, which is going to happen right around the April or so time frame, I want us to just take a little time out and consider these names. The names of God. We started this little mini-series a couple weeks ago. February 5th, and we started with Genesis 1-1, the very first word in the very first verse in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. That word God we saw is the Hebrew word Elohim. And if you remember from that study, God revealed, us, revealed to us two significant, very profound attributes of God in that name Elohim. The God creator, the, the fact that he's the creator God, and also the redeemer. Last week, we looked at a different word for God, the word Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, also in the Hebrew word translated Yehovah, Yehovah God, the great God. And in that study last week we looked at two more attributes we saw this god that is intimate with us who desires nothing more than to reveal himself to his creatures and his creation the intimate revelator is jehovah god this morning we're gonna look at a whole different aspect two new attributes of god we're gonna see in the scriptures and for the first time The phrase or the title, God Almighty, and in the Hebrew, El Shaddai. We'll define and break these down. In this study, in this view of God this morning, we're going to look at the God of provision and the God of impossibilities. In fact, there's a storyline that we're going to consider this morning that is consistent with what with what the Gabriel angel, with what the angel Gabriel revealed to Mary in the gospel of Luke chapter one. If you remember the the Christmas story, he, Gabriel comes to Mary and he imparts to her that, that she's going to be impregnated by the Holy Spirit. And I couldn't imagine being a young teenage young lady, imagine the overwhelming depth of that revelation, right? And Mary goes on, I'm sorry, Gabriel goes on and he reveals to Mary that her cousin Elizabeth will also be pregnant. As a matter of fact, Elizabeth, if you're not aware of this, was a little bit older in her life and she was barren. She hadn't had any children the entire, the, her entire life and she was pregnant with none other than John the Baptist. And in Luke chapter 1, verses 36 and 37, listen to what Gabriel says to Mary, and behold, thy cousin Elizabeth... She hath conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her. She was six months pregnant with John the Baptist. And Gabriel says, who was called barren. And listen to verse 37. I love this verse, a profound verse. For with God, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. (laughs) That is the God that we serve. Is there anything too hard for God? It says in Genesis chapter 18, after God reveals himself for the first time under this name. So with that said, I want to introduce you to this next name. And you find this next name in no other, none other place than in the book of Genesis, because the book of Genesis, as we know, is the book of beginnings. And it's in the book of beginnings where God establishes a lot of foundational things. Those of you that have been joining me on Wednesday nights, you're very aware, and you're very mindful of the fact that one of the principles of Bible study, as a matter of fact, principle number six is the principle of first mention. In other words, when God reveals something to us for the first time in the scriptures, he's going to lay and provide for us a pattern through the rest of the Bible. 
There's also another principle that we've considered in our studies on Wednesday nights, and that's the principle of measured words. And that principle simply Im- implies that the individual words and phrases of the Bible are the key to understanding its truths. So when you see the phrase or you see the, the name for God in ca- all caps, capital L-O-R-D, he's communicating to us a very significant truth that is different than the name Lord in lowercase, capital L, little O-R-N-D, which we'll look at next week in the name Adonai. He's revealing himself to us. He's making these attributes known. And in Genesis 17, you find a very interesting and fascinating story. A very profound backstory that proves this God of impossibilities and this God of provision. So the first principle that I want us to consider this morning Laurie, can you advance that for me, please? Let's go to the first point. I'm not sure why it's not moving. Is it locked up? There we go. One more, please. Is what we're going to look at. We're going to look at this almighty God as all providing. Listen to how the, how the text begins, how the principle begins here in verse number one. And when Abraham was 90 years old and nine... The Lord appeared to Abraham, or to Abram, get, let's get that right, that's, that's on me. It's not Abraham yet, and we're going to see why. But his name is Abram, and again, look at the name that is mentioned for God in the text. And when Abram was 90, 99 and years old and 9, the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, in other words, Jehovah, the God of, the God of revelation, the God of intimacy, appeared to Abram and said unto him, and listen to what he refers to himself here. I am the almighty God. There's the phrase in the phrase almighty God, El Shaddai. It says, walk before me and be thou perfect. That word perfect does not mean sinless. It simply means, all right, Abraham, all right, Abram, it's time to mature in your life. It is absolutely time to grow up. No more nonsense. Stay focused on whom I, I am and this covenant, this provision that I have promised you. Don't lose sight. Don't lose perspective of who I am and what I desire and want to accomplish in your life. And this whole provision thing begins for us in of all places in the book of Genesis. So turn to Genesis chapter 12 because We're going to follow up with the second point when we get to 12. But let me share with you just a couple thoughts about this name, Shaddai or El Shaddai. You know from our study that the word El, E-L, simply means, or it's another, it's it's a definitive term, the word for the word God, the word El. The name Shaddai shows up another 24 times in the Old Testament. And there's another part of the Hebrew word. The Hebrew word, root word for this word, Shaddai, is the word shad, S-H-A-D, meaning, listen to this, meaning breast. As in a a woman's breast. And as it relates to the word breast, it signifies that God is the one who nourishes, who supplies, and who satisfies. C.I. Schofield said in his study Bible that God is Shaddai, meaning that he is the nourisher, the strength giver who pours himself into believing lives. This is what he desires to do in us, is to pour himself into us. Schofield goes on, he says this, El Shaddai is that the name of God which sets him forth as the strength giver and the satisfier of his people. This is the attribute that God wants to reveal to us about himself. Is that he is sitting back waiting for us. Waiting on, waiting on us to allow him to bless. And this is where you see that truth play out profoundly. Look with me real quick in Genesis chapter 12 real quick. 
In Genesis chapter 12, you find the introduction to this guy named Abram. Again, if you study the scriptures in the Old Testament, you'll find a fascinating change in what God is doing. You know, in his country, we just went through a, a pretty radical change with our, with, our, um, with our government, with our executive branch especially, right? And this is what you're seeing play out in Genesis chapter number 12. In the first 11 chapters of Genesis, you find God focusing on, on what the Bible refers to as these three, three different dispensations or how God dispenses his grace or his mercy throughout uh, those first 2,000 years of human history. In fact, there's 2,000 years from Genesis chapter 1 to Genesis chapter 12. A lot of folks aren't even aware of that. There's another 2,000 years from Genesis 12 to the time of Christ. And then another 2,000 years from Christ to where we're at today. So the Bible is divided time-wise from a timeline perspective in three major sec- segments. Genesis 1 through 12, 2,000 years. Genesis chapter 12 to the time of Christ, another 2,000 years. And from Christ to today, another 2,000 years. That, was, that is how the Bible has laid out human history for us. So we're going into a major, what the Bible refers to, dispensation when you get from chapter 11 of Genesis to chapter 12. He's going from from Adam and from Noah and from this human government situation that plays out in Genesis 10 and 11 to a whole new era. And look at how the story picks up in Genesis chapter 12. It says this in our text. It says... Now the Lord, the Lord, capital L, capital O-R-D, in other words, now the Lord, Jehovah, had said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. Hang on to this land thing, man, because it's significant even today. It says in verse 2, and I will make of thee a great nation And I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. He calls this guy Abram. He says, all right, Abram, I've got a plan for you. We're going to change this game drastically. I'm going to create a a nation out of you, out of your loins. And out of your loins are going to come a people that that I'm going to bless. And my plan and my desire for them is that they be a blessing. You know, from a principal perspective, this is what the church is called to be. Why does God bless us? Because we deserve to be blessed. How many of us really deserve the blessings that we receive in this life? You know why he blesses us? You know why he blesses you? So that you could be a blessing. And he says in verse number three, this is profound. And I'm going to bless them that bless thee. And I'm going to curse them that curseth thee. And in thee all families of the earth shall be blessed. And if you really stop and consider any foreign policy issue or decision, it's laid out in verse 3. Governments that have historically blessed the nation of Israel have been blessed. And governments that have cursed the nation of Israel are paying the consequence of that cursing. Even to this day. And right here in these three verses... You find God laying out this covenant, this plan for this guy named Abram. This is the backstory. This is where he begins to lay out this new era, this new dispensation where God is going to be a provider to his people. Where Almighty God is going to perform the impossible. And we know in order for seed and in order for people to be birthed or to be born, there needs to be some conceiving going on, huh? There needs to be some relationships that have been established. And you know from your Bible that this guy named Abram also had a wife and her name was what? Sarah. Was it Sarah in the initial phase? It wasn't. Her name was Sarai. 
Because here's the cool thing about God. When we get to that place where we realize our purpose, you know what he begins to do? He begins to change our identity. He begins to change how we think, how we perceive ourselves. He even changes our name. As we'll see in in Genesis chapter 17. But what's fascinating about this story is there's a backstory behind it. Look back with me now in just Genesis 17. I wanted to take you there. And if you look back real quick at 12 before I move on, look what it says here in verse number four. And so Abram departed as the Lord had spoken. Is everybody back with me in 12? I'm sorry, I kind of threw you off here. Look at verse four. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him. And Abram was how old? 75 years old. Mark that. He was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran, which is in Mesopotamia, in the Fertile Crescent, in what is known as modern-day Iraq. Strategic again. All that stuff going back, all that stuff that is going on in the world today, God is taking back, taking us all back to the original story. How old is he? 75 Now look with me in Genesis 17. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, now the story picks up again some 24 years later. Hmm. What's up with that? What happened between chapters 12 and 17? People lose sight of the promise. We start to lose perspective of who the provider is. Of all that he has planned and all that he desires to reveal to you and to me. So the time difference between Genesis 12.4 and Genesis 17.1, these 24 years, a lot of stuff transpired in that gap including a plan that was concocted to help God accomplish his provision. Anybody been there? Don't worry, Lord, I I got this figured out. I don't really need your help right now. And you know what that causes when we do that? We lose some very precious time in this life. How many times have we heard from behind this pulpit that the most precious thing that you possess is time because every minute, every hour, every day, every week, month, year that goes by, you will never, ever get back. This is why the Apostle Paul twice in the New Testament challenges both the Ephesians and the Colossians to redeem time, make up for lost time because you're not going to get back the time that you lose. And when we choose to do things our way, guess what? Things get pretty dicey. Things can get pretty messed up in our lives and all of a sudden we find ourselves kind of like the children of Israel in the book of Exodus, wandering for 40 years, going from sand dune to sand dune, asking ourselves, how did I end up here? And keep in mind, if you consider those stories, those are God's people. Those were God's people. We're talking about Abram, God's chosen man. What happened that caused such chaos? Look with me now in chapter 16, and we'll find part of the story where things go awry. We know from Genesis 12 and 13 that this wife of Abram, Sarai, was barren. She was not able to bear children. And listen closely to this chapter because the world is still dealing with the implications of what happened here in Genesis chapter 16, believe it or not. It's incredible. The consequences, the implications, the things that play out that happen for the rest of somebody's life are are consequential. They're significant. It matters 
when we deviate, when we, we move God, from God's provision and from his promise, all of a sudden, we have to own up to that decision or that choice. God always brings forks in the road in our lives. One of the last things that God tells Moses to do in Deuteronomy chapter 28 is he's standing on Mount Nebo looking over, over the promised land and getting ready to take the land with Joshua in the following book. He says, all right, people, gather around, look at the land, look at what God has promised us. And you know what he says to them? You know what Moses says through God to the children of Israel? Choose this day. You choose. He says, choose this day, blessing or cursing, life or death, but you choose. And then we are having to deal with the consequence, or you will deal with the consequence of those choices. If not tomorrow, next week, maybe even 10 years from now, 15, 20 years from now. And in this case, listen to this. Almost 5,000 years later, 4,000 years later, that are still, at, that are still amp impacting the geopolitical situation in the Middle East today because of what transpired right here in chapter 16. Look with me in 16. It says this. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children. And she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. Mark her name now, this Egyptian handmaiden, because she also shows up in a prophecy in the book of Psalms, in Psalm, the 83rd chapter of Psalms, that is still yet to play out. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing, I pray thee, that you go unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her, and Abram hearkened, to the voice of Sarai. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her handmaid, the Egyptian, after Abram, and dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. What a generous woman, huh? <laughs> Little did she know what she was going to cause for the next 4,000 years. And Sarai said unto Abram, I'm sorry, verse 4. And he went in under Hagar. Abram, in other words, had relations with Hagar. And Hagar, her handmaid in the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt there. I, mean, I, already, I already read that verse, right? I'm sorry, verse 4. And he went in under Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she, had, that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. So she has Hagar have relationships with her husband, and then... After she ends up getting pregnant, now she's upset about the situation. Current circumstance. It says in verse 5, And Sarah said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes, and the Lord judged between me and thee. But Abram said unto Sarah, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way of Shur. And he said unto her, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence camest thou, and whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to my mistress, and submit thyself unto thy hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that thou shalt be numbered for multitude. In other words, God says to Hagar, you are going to multiply, kind of like God had promised to Abraham, from a Hebrew Jewish perspective, Look who she begins to deal with him. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and thou shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. Verse 12, this is profound. And he will be a wild man, 
His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And she called the name of the Lord, and, spa- and, and, and as she called the name of the Lord that spake on her, Thou God seest me, for she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? And right here you find the origins of, we, of what we know today as the Arab peoples. This is why even today they claim Abraham is their father. Anybody seen, and has anybody seen or has observed recent pictures of what is Jerusalem today? When you look at the Temple Mount, when you consider the Temple Mount or when you see a picture of Jerusalem, what is the one thing that stands out overtly right off the bat? What comes to mind? The Golden Dome. You know what that, you know what that, that, you know what the actual name of the Golden Dome is? It's called the Dome of the Rock. It's a mosque. It's an Islamic mosque. It's been controlled by Islam for the last 400 years the Temple Mount has. You know why it's referred to as the Dome of the Rock? Because it's there where the Quran teaches that Abraham offered Ishmael up to God. You go into the Dome of the Rock today, there's a huge stone in there, and it's there where Islam teaches through the Quran that that is where Abraham offered up Ishmael. Well, you know what the Bible teaches in Genesis chapter 22? That who got offered up in that location? Isaac. Do you see the conflict? Do you see what happens when we try and to do things our way? When we don't adhere to the promise and the consequence of that situation, right now even our government is dealing with this one state, two state, three state solution, not three state, but two state solution. You know why that is? Because the sons of Ishmael refuse to ec- ec- re- absolutely refuse to recognize the sons of Isaac, the Jews and the Palestinians. The consequence of not staying true to his provision, to his promise. When we go and do things our way, I'm guilty of that. We did it just two years ago. And I accept full responsibility for this. Remember this, George, Larry, Tom? Remember the situation with this building? In 2014, God blessed us with that property across the street, that land, our little parking lot. What is our parking lot today? And we were kind of waiting and praying that God would begin to um, open up some doors so that we could build a facility across the street. We have a neighbor that owns the land just to the north of this lot, our lot. His name is Ernie Romero, wonderful man. Maybe because his last name is Romero, I don't know. (laughs) Phase one realty. A year ago, actually in 2015, he comes to me. He says, hey, John, I'm considering starting to develop my land over here. Would you guys consider giving me an easement to get to the property? La-di-da, la-di-da, and on we went. And I said, absolutely, Ernie. We'll work with you. We'll do whatever you think we need to do to, you know, you can get to your land. We can work something out, I'm sure. And he says to me, by the way, what are you guys planning on doing? And I shared with him, we're planning on getting a facility, but we're also waiting to see what's going to happen with this building because we just learned two months prior. This is almost two years to the day, huh, George? Went to the bank, and the bank had already foreclosed on the lady that owned this facility. And, um, man, God was opening some incredible doors And we went to the bank and said, you know what, we would love to buy this building if you guys are okay with that. We negotiated, we went back and forth, we agreed on a price with a very profound condition. The bank says, if you guys could close in 30 days, you could have it at that price. Awesome. We met with some people from the city, Ike was in that meeting, we said, what do you guys think? And 
you know, we started to look at some things. We were going to have to jump through some hoops with the city because of some zoning things and some facility stuff. And we started to use phrases like, let's just buy it and take the risk. In other words, we don't really need you. We don't really need you in this little decision, Lord. We can handle this. You know what God did? He slams the door shut. You ain't going to trust me, huh? Well, you know what? You're going to lose some time now. <laughs> a couple months later, Ernie reaches that back out to me. Or Actually, I called Ernie. I said, Ernie, because the bank was not going to sell it to us. I said, Ernie, do we still want to do this deal? <laughs> and he goes, well, what happened? What happened to the building? And I told him. And he goes, let me see what I can do about it. And he goes and he literally buys the building outright in like seven days. <laughs> closes with the bank and then he calls and he goes hey i just want you to know john that i bought the building i said oh no lord why we were so excited about getting in this building and you know what ernie said he says i'm going to sell it back to you for what you asked for and take whatever time you need to close that's how god works you know why because after we recognize our stupidity or my stupidity how to go back on our face and realize his goodness, his greatness, this God of provision, this God of impossibilities, and here we are today because God used Ernie. And what a profound way that God works. So what is the lesson learned in this passage is that Abraham and Isaac had to learn that when God promises something, only God can give it. He doesn't need our help. He is the provider. He is the giver of everything. He is the blesser. He is the source of all blessings. This is the message. This is the promise. This is what God desires from those of us that claim him as our God. Is he saying to us every single day, just trust me. Just believe in me. I'm going to bless them that bless you. I'm going to use you. You're gonna, I've, I've created you to be a blessing and just stay true to my message. Just stay true to who I am and let me do the rest. And that's how he begins and that's how he works in our lives. And if you go back to Genesis 17, you see some very profound things beginning to play out. Look what it says here in verse number 2. And it says, and it says in, in Genesis 17, 2, And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply the exceeding. This is 24 years later, after losing 24 years because of what transpired in Genesis chapter number 16. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. And here it is, verse 5. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. God had a plan for the Jewish people all the way back to Genesis chapter 12 if they would have, if we would just stay true to his provision and to his promise. Just depend on me. Realize who I am. And he goes on in verse 8, he says something really profound here. I want you to see this. Look what he says next in verse 8. He says in verse 8, And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Wow, that is profound. Because that very land that we're just reading about right now is the very land that is being debated and discussed today in the UN and even in our, in our government. 
And he says, I'm giving this to you, Abraham, and to your seed, the land. Isn't it fascinating? Aren't you amazed that God is implementing his plan right before our eyes? That it's happening whether we realize it or not, or whether we know it or not, or whether we like it or not. That what you see happening in the Middle East today with that land and all those players and all those parties and all those descendants of Ishmael are still playing a huge role in making sure that this promise doesn't come to fruition and also involving other Western nations and governments and whomever. Because what's fascinating, what's incredible to me is the truth of God and His Word and His plan and His purpose in redeeming not just our lives, but His planet. He's setting the stage. The history of that land is so incredibly profound. You know how we know we're getting there? Now we know that we're on the downside of this thing called the church age. Because God has performed an incredible miracle right before our eyes, known as the restoration of the nation of Israel. For 2,000 years, that name Israel ceased to exist on any map until 1948. You know what God did with World War I? He allowed the British, because of World War I, by defeating the Germans and the Turks in the Middle East, to take control of what was then referred to as modern-day Palestine. And right around that same time period, a Hungarian Jew by the name of Theodor Herzl began to, parti- began to petition the British government to allow and to provide a place because the Brits pretty much ruled the world back at the turn of the century. Kind of like where America is today. And he petitions the British government and his request was simply, man, we're living here in Europe. We're starting to experience this persecution, this blame for everything and all the ills of Europe and All the stuff is going crazy. It's getting nutty. Would you consider, please, British Parliament, a piece of property somewhere on the planet where the Jews of the world could migrate? They considered places like Argentina, like Algeria. And you know what came out of World War I? What became known as the Balfour Declaration in 1917. You know what God did? With the Belfort Declaration, it gave a piece of land back to the Jewish people that had been dispersed since 70 AD after the Roman Emperor Titus came in and massacred thousands of them. Is what become known in history as the War of the Jews. But you know what happened? Some of those Jewish people that were living in Europe and throughout the world said, you know what? I ain't ready to go back just yet. Things aren't so bad here in Germany and in France and England and other places. And lo and behold, 1930, this crazy, bizarre little Austrian guy who had been defeated in World War I by the British and the Americans, sitting in a German prison cell writes a book called Mein Kampf or My Struggle and you know what chapter 11 of Mein Kampf was all about the dissolution or the destruction of all Jewish people that they were to blame for all the ills and all that was wrong in Europe we know who that guy is right none other than Adolf Hitler 
so when he finally comes to power, the guy finally comes to power, and what does he start to do? He starts to implement exactly what he said he was going to do in chapter 11 of Mein Kampf. And he gathers up Jewish people from the four corners of Europe, and he's taking them into these things called concentration camps, and he's killing just by the millions. Six million people, six million Jewish people dying at the hands of Adolf Hitler. And at the end of World War II, and we know the story, he gets defeated, right? You know what the huge outcome of World War II was? It got the people to get back to the land. Three years, almost to the, to the month, May 15th, 1948, the Israeli, the Jewish flag this with the Star of David on it flew over an independent Israel three years after World War II. And today, that little country of six million Jews, Israelis, probably has one of the baddest armies and if not the best in Air Force on the entire planet. Tiny little Israel Tell me God's not at work. Tell me he's not going to implement his plan regardless of who's in charge, wherever. So hang on for that ride because our last and final principle is this El Shaddai. This almighty God is all powerful. He is the God of provision. He is the God of promise and he's also a God of power. And here's a fascinating truth as we close out this morning. This phrase, this title, God Almighty, only shows up in one book in all of the New Testament. It's so prevalent in the Old Testament. You find it in Genesis, seven times in Genesis, 31 times in Job. Throughout Isaiah and Ezekiel, you find the phrase or the title for God, El Shaddai, or Almighty God, or God Almighty. But only in one place in the New Testament. It shows up seven times in this book. Anybody have any clue of which book it is? Anybody have any idea? What comes to mind when we consider all that we've said here this morning? book of revelation the book of revelation seven times we find the phrase god almighty almighty god you know why you know what revelation is about god preparing this planet for his return he's coming he's coming and the charge and the challenge for every believer sitting in this room and throughout this world, will we be found ready? Will, be, will we be exactly and will we be doing exactly what he's called us to do and to be in this world? Because he's coming back. And the first place in the book of Revelation where you find this great name is in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 8. And I don't know what you know about chapter 4, but it's a heavenly worldview. It's a heavenly view. It's, it happens right after the rapture of the church. And God is revealing himself to his creatures, to his creation. And you know what people are doing in Revelation chapter number 4? Exactly what we did before church this morning. We're praising him. The entire world, the entire planet is praising God. Worshiping God. And it says this in Revelation chapter 4 verse verse. On uh, number eight, and the four beasts had each of them with six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy. Listen to this, this phrase, this title, Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. In Revelation chapters 11, 15, 16, and 19, you find the phrase showing up again, 
right smack in the midst of all the craziness in this world that will play out between chapter 6 and 19 of the book of Revelation. And right smack in the middle of his return in chapter 19, in verse number 15, you find these words by John, the revelator, as he saw this vision. And out of his mouth, speaking of Jesus, goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite all the nations, all those nations that have turned their back against the Jewish people throughout history. He's avenging them. One of these days, I'll, I'll provide you the opportunity. Ask the question in Bible study, what is really going to play out at the second coming of Christ? You know what it is? It's a campaign. It's not just one battle as we refer to it as the battle of Armageddon. There's an entire campaign of events, of battles, a series of battles. As he's avenging all the ills and all the wrongs that people have done, that this world has done to his precious called people known as the nation of Israel. And out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword. That with it should he smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of what? Of Almighty God. Man, he's coming. And he's a warrior. And he's going to make things right. And then you go two chapters later, in chapter 21. A glimpse of eternity future. And you find these words in Revelation chapter 21 in verse 22. And I saw no temple therein. In other words, there was no more need for this facility or this structure over on the temple mount. Or anywhere for that matter. Why? It says, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. He becomes our dwelling place. Almighty God. God Almighty. El Shaddai. The God of provision. And the impossible. Wanting and desiring us to include us in his purpose. And in his plan. El Shaddai. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you, Lord, for...